big deep breath, everybody. It's Friday, okay? Friday is the best day of the week because it's the beginning of the weekend when none of us really have to work. Unless, of course, you have youth sports to do or parenting to take care of because that's a job that you never have a day off. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Green Rush Really Live, the regularly scheduled business of cannabis talk show that we here, have here on every Friday afternoon at 4 o'clock. I'm Jimmy Young, the founder of Pro Cannabis Media. We'll be here for the next two hours, and we've got, I think we have something like 13 or 14 guests coming up. So we have a very full show, and a reminder that at the end of this show at 6 o'clock, we do run our weekly We Talk News program, and I apologize <clears throat> I had to anchor it because Elena Pinto is on vacation. Next week, she's back. So the, the number of views will double. I promise you that. I can tell you that right now. All right, let's get right into it. It is Women's History Month. And that means we need, not like we ever needed it, an excuse to talk about women in our society and in our world and what role they play. But if we have to do this every March, I'm comfortable with that, too. Maybe we should do it once or twice during the year, too. We could certainly talk about that. And joining us at the top of the show here today is Brooke Westlake. She is the uh, founder and CEO, I believe, of Women in the Cannabis Expo. And uh, Brooke, tell us a little bit, when is that next one coming up and where? So we are planning, we're actually building out for the next three years, which is pretty exciting. And thanks again for having me on. I love your show. Uh, this year, we're looking at hosting two shows because last year we hosted four and that was a lot. So we're going to do focus on East Coast, West Coast. And we are looking at Chicago is either going to be in June or August. And then Las Vegas will be September or October. We're just waiting for some other show dates so we can just kind of tighten things up and then we'll be making our announcements on the official dates. And then for the next uh, 2024, 2025, we will definitely be in Vegas. We're gonna be international in Canada both years. And then we get to choose what other East Coast cities we want. So we have to open options, but that's that's what we're doing. We're pretty excited about it. That's great. And I have a great keynote speaker for you who joins us now. Uh, she is the Chief Marketing Officer of Acreage Holdings, uh, Patricia Rossi Santucci. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi. Good to see you again, Patricia. Thank you so much for having me, Jimmy. Looking forward to our conversation. Oh, absolutely. And let's start right off the top. Uh, how are things going at Acreage Holdings? Uh, how challenging a job is it to be a marketing executive for a multi-state operator? Uh, it's going well. We're making a lot of progress in the last few years. I've been very uh, transformative for our company. And, you know, and the 2023 is a challenging year. We, we knew it. Uh, we, we termed it uh, weathering the storm. I mean, what, what can, you know, everything is in motion, right? There is more competition. There's price compression. I mean, China is meeting with Russia. I mean, there's all these things, macro environment that is putting additional pressure to our industry and reinforcing the, the need for it to uh, really go back to the fundamentals of business and really focusing. I mean, we've, we're having a lot of focus and discipline to make progress and we start to see some results on, you know, retail data and all of that. So uh, a lot of work, but a lot of progress and um, yeah, no, it's not easy. It's definitely not a a walk in the park, but that's cannabis for you. <laughs> where, where were you three or four years ago? Oh, no, I knew where you were three or four years ago. You were in Maine and you were running the uh, Wellness Connection, I think. Is Correct. that what, right? And yes. um, and uh, I got to interview you at a NECAN event, I'm pretty sure, in Portland, Maine, which uh, if anybody has been following my life, <clears throat> uh, I spent a good 11 years of my career in sports at the CBS affiliated up in Portland, Maine, and I still have a lot of friends up there. And any time that there is an excuse for me to go back to Portland between the months of May and October, okay, because I'm not going to, I don't need to go back in November to, to April. I just don't, okay. Uh, it, it is colder in Maine than it is in Boston. And if you're watching from California, it's much colder here than it is over there. But I, I do want to get into the the, the multi-state operator, uh, Patricia. As you know, uh, a lot of people are, are looking, 
look at the things that the MSOs are doing and they point fingers and they blame and, they, and they're, they're all upset. But I've been one who always says, you know what, a new industry, a young industry, an industry that's writing the rules as they go along needs this kind of support to keep it going. Is that an accurate statement? Yes, absolutely. You know, you're a nascent industry. There's no, the path has never been charted. There's no golden book of how you should be doing it. So I think there's, um, it's important that you uh, really are creative, problem solving, and go back to some fundamentals because there's still some business fundamentals that we have to apply every day. Uh, add a serious dose of grit, and then you become a successful operator. I think compliance and regulatory system are making it challenging for us in this, you know, each state is different, but at the end of the day, uh, you know, the, the principles of how to do it right are the same. You know, I originally come from France, so the fact that there's all these states that do it a little differently for me is very reminiscent of Europe, right? Because Germany does it differently in Spain and France. So I'm, I'm overall comfortable with the nuances, even though some days it's frustrating, but I think it's all about really um, key learning, sharing best practices, and, you know, um, problem solving is very important. Um, which is another reason why I think women should be ruling the world. Um, Brooke, uh, talk a little bit. Uh, I, it's your turn, Brooke, to ask a question of Patricia. And I know that you have a few, but I definitely think that we should be focused on how challenging it is for women in the cannabis business and why aren't there more of them? So you can ask any other question around that. Go ahead. I would love to know, Patricia, what inspired you to get into the cannabis industry as a woman? Uh, you know, we are, the numbers of us in this industry are dropping drastically and continue to decline and see level positions and whatnot. So tell us what inspired you to be in this industry and why you're still here, because we know, you know, and I know how challenging it is to be in this space. Yes. Uh, so I've been in the cannabis industry for, let's count, 12 years now. So wow. um, I am still standing. Um, what excited me about cannabis um, is the challenge, really. The fact that it was uncharted territory and everything had to be created. The challenge of there's not that many opportunities uh, in your career you can have to you know, I started as an operator, so where, you know, you 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 deal with horticulture, with uh, policy, with building a company the right way, making sure patients are, are living a better life and all of that. So even though the challenge was big, that was really inspiring me because I wanted to make a difference. I was looking for, you know, I think I have, if I look at all the the points in my career, it's really about making the impossible possible building teams, brands, and companies uh, in, you know, in marketing and advertising. And so I found my spot in, in cannabis, crazy or not. And I think it's still a challenge. We've made so much progress, but there's still so much more to do. Um, you know, 12 years ago, there were more women, uh, I think, at the onset. Um, and, and, and some have you know, uh, taking different paths, but I think there's also some that are still there. I mean, Nancy and I were, <laughs> Nancy Whitemind from WANA, we were visiting Maine together 10 years ago and we're still there. So there's there's a serious dose of resilience and grit and I think women have it. So we we can do this. And tell women. us- Go ahead, oh, go, go ahead. Jimmy. No, go ahead, go. Jimmy. Oh. I was going to say, tell us how many companies you've been in this industry for such a long time, 12 years. That's fantastic. How many companies have you helped, worked with, um, been their CEO, been their representative? Share that with all of our viewers because it, it says a lot that you've been in the industry for 12 years. So tell everybody just how much you have done in this industry in the 12 years space of time. So I started in Maine uh, with in 2011, being one of the first multi, uh, vertically integrated operators for dispensary, 40,000 square foot grow. One of the first 
biggest operator in the Northeast with a, a clear focus on brand experience, customer service, and, and, and customer centricity, taking with me a lot of the, the work I had done with some CPG clients in my uh, advertising background. So the interesting thing is I've been 12 years in industry, industry but only two companies. Uh, the first one was Maine, where uh, I was. I started as a board director, then became uh, VP of marketing, then CEO, then CEO for um, nine years. Uh, and there, I built a company, an all-around good company, uh, of about 100 employees, um, thousands and thousands of patients, and really making a difference and being one of the first. Uh, this also happened to be one of the first states uh, or the proof of concept, if you will, from which Acreage was built from. So, and now with Acreage, uh, main operation is, is part of Acreage uh, now, but they, they, they gave me an opportunity, which is phenomenal for me to go back to my passion, which is brand marketing. So now I'm with Acreage and um, my interpretation of marketing is very wide. It's everything from product innovation, product development, brand marketing, retail operation, and marketing operations. So I've I've done it all. Um, that's what I think is phenomenal when you're in a startup. You know, I've I've pruned, I've trimmed, I've bagged, I've delivered, I've from the ground up because I think when it's something so new. Uh, you need to really start from the ground up and fully understand it to make sure you create a company. For me, it was really important, despite the fact that it was legally illegal and all those things. What really exciting me was to create a company that lasts. And one of my biggest, proudest accomplishment is some of my first hire as employees. They're still there and they're celebrating their 11 years anniversary. And so there's... I've always seen cannabis as a very positive stimulus for the economy, namely in Maine, where there's not that many opportunities in building something profound that could make a difference. So that's what has been driving me for those 12 years and a lot of stories and adventures along the way. Oh, I'm sure. I'm sure you have a lot. You're going to have to pick out, I think after Jimmy asks you a question, you're going to have to pick out like your most favorite story that's like the most memorable meaningful and it just it's something that comes to your mind all the time when you're talking about being in this industry oh but but well but let me ask one more question if you don't mind. Uh, at, the, at this point which would be fun i want to ask you how being a c-level uh executive prepares you for the next step and what is the next step in the growth of a of a, of a career woman in corporate america mm -hmm. Oh, you know, I've had a lot of C's in my past careers. I mean, I've been chief creative officer, chief operating officer, chief everything officer, which is my nickname for CEO, chief marketing officer. Uh, for me, it's all about the same fundamentals, people, people, team, uh, and transparency and clarity. What is my next step? I don't know. My next step is not really about a title. It's about the mission. It's about the passion. And it's about making a difference. Um, I think it's all about also the principle that you bring and having a, a certain um, vision or principles. You, you, you know, that's your North Star that guides you through this. What is my next adventure? I don't know. I have no idea. We'll see. It's fluid. It's certainly great to be part of an industry like you're, like we're all in, if you will, uh, that can make a difference in people's lives. I'm sure every person on this call and, and the entire show has heard hundreds of stories of people who say cannabis has saved my life, cannabis has changed mm -hmm. my life. It is starting to be accepted as a plant medicine. I'm all for the um, normalization of acceptance of this plant, not necessarily the legalization, because legalization means there's going to be law and politicians involved. And I'm not a big fan of either of those two, let's just say. That being said, um, acceptance. Uh, Aaron Smith, who's the head of the NCIA, said, told me a great thing in front of a lot of people at Albany, New York, when they first uh, made it legal in New York. They had a membership drive up there. And Aaron said, anybody who's in the industry today, okay, has an obligation to 
educate anybody that you come in contact with. And that includes whether you're going to get the, a, a cup of coffee or a newspaper and you're just talking about something to strangers, don't be afraid to say, I'm in the cannabis industry. Oh, yeah. uh, are we seeing a softening of that at all? Do you get, I'll ask both of you that question. I will say that it took me about a year to get comfortable with telling people and there's a couple of reasons for that. If anybody has looked at my background, I came from healthcare 20, 20 plus years. Uh, if you would have asked me 10 years ago, if I would be in cannabis, I probably would have laughed you out of a room. I grew up with huge propaganda of being a dare kid. I also had my bio dad was in and out of prison for extreme heavy, heavy drugs. So heroin, meth, things like that. And so the propaganda put a really negative taste in my mouth of wanting to pursue and, and thinking of it as a child, as a, being a normal, a plant, medicine, any of those things. When it got presented to me, I was a little shocked. And then I started to do my due diligence. And I thought, you know, like Patricia said, there's all these opportunities to create your own thing. And so oftentimes, as I've gotten comfortable and now I'm in four years, I proudly tell people what I do. I proudly share with them. And I enjoy every aspect of it. But like Patricia said, you wear all these different hats. There's no gold standard rule of thumb. And that to me with my artistic side and my uh, education side has been a lot of fun. And so, you know, I tell everybody I'm the janitor, I'm the secretary, mm -hmm. I'm the email, you know, I'm doing all the jobs. I'm the CEO and I'm all the things. And and I'm happy to say also, I am one of those stories of patients that it came into my life for work and it's now literally keeping me alive because I had a very near death experience, lost a section of colon, was very sick, could not keep food down. And it's now something that is keeping me alive daily. I don't have a nutrition valve. So for me, I feel so honored. It's really come full circle in my life. And, and Patricia, are you sensing any movement towards normalization? I'm not going to get into the legalization, but the normalization acceptance of the plant. Yes, there's definitely a normalization. I, I live in Maine. If you look at the, the East Coast, all the states now more or less have a, a, a cannabis under uh, one form or another that is, um, you know, legalized, whether it's medical or adult shoes. So just the fact that you no longer you know, have the segmentation of states, it's normalizing the conversation because it's a reality in everybody's state. Um, when it comes to having conversation, I think it has come such a long way. Uh, I mean, 12 years ago, people were hanging up on me when I was calling a banker, when I was calling the insurance, or people were telling me, oh, you're part of those people. Uh, I always love that one. Oh, now you're part of those people. Um, you're, you know, you're destroying your career. What are you doing? And you know what that did? I mean, uh, that made me want even more to prove people around, wrong and to make the impossible possible because I didn't want it. So I've, we've, you know, in my household, we've normalized this conversation with, with our children, with our friends, because I think it's a very important role that we can play. And not necessarily that I want to have everybody use cannabis, but it's more the idea of let's talk about it. Let's have, it's not about conversion, it's about conversations and making sure that all questions can be asked and and some some of my friends really don't like it, but they're still my friends, you know, and that's that's just the way it is. And you just have to accept uh, the difference. And, and also, you know, I'm a very responsible uh, operator in the sense that I understand there's psychoactive effects. It's not something everybody should use. Absolutely. And I've always been advocate for safety testing and all these things. So I think there's it's easy it's 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 similar to all topics in life making a generality is not the right way but i view this as an important part of what we do which is try to have conversations and see where they take you right that's that's always been my philosophy as a talk show host too um but i want to get into the brand the branding uh the, the challenges of having strict rules about marketing and what you can say what you can't say and 
every single state has a different set of rules. And I'm pretty sure I just read this week that the state of New York is not going to allow billboards, which you definitely have in the Northeast, um, almost every quarter mile uh, as you go wet east to west on the Mass per Turnpike or west to east on not the Massachusetts Maine. Turnpike. There's a new billboard in Maine, but and yes. I don't, are there, are there any bill, like, can any company have a billboard in Maine? Because if I remember correctly, there are certain things that people in Maine, they say, no, we don't like that there. So I, regular billboards are okay, but cannabis, no in Maine, yes? No, no, no billboard at all. No billboards, right, for everybody. By the way, that's fair. I got no problem with that, you know? It, it's the injustices. It's basically a state like New York saying, we're not going to allow uh, billboards on our highways. So no, I know, okay. and, and I've always found this pretty ironic because they give you a, a license to operate, but no way to communicate with your patients or your, your clients. And they task you with educating and informing, mm -hmm. but they don't give you your like end cuff with the, the communication channels you can use to do that. So for me, um, that was a challenge at the onset, but past of my you know, part of my career was building uh, experiential marketing agency. What does this mean is the idea that you can communicate best human to human and find a way. There's always a pathway. If you have a will, there is a way, I think you say here in this country. So it's like, it's very important, you know, grassroots events, one-on-one -on -one communication. This cannot be forbidden, right? If anybody comes through the door of a dispensary, you need to have a conversation, not necessarily a transaction, but just a conversation answering questions. And then and then you find ways. Um, I, you know, it's it, regulators keep making it interesting, but I think even packaging can be a way of communication. There's there's so many tactics, so many channels. Um, we can always do it, but worst come to worst, you always have a human that can talk to a human. Right. And, and, it, and as a communicator and someone who teaches young people communication skills, it is still a challenge. Teaching generation text how to talk is a challenge. Okay. I, I mean, pick up the phone and call me. I, I, I don't, I don't do phone calls. I'm like, come on. It, it, they call it a phone for a reason, but I also, I'm also an old fuddy daddy, so I, I get that too. Uh, what I want to talk about the the world of science and how it relates to the industry. And traditionally, women were never thought to be scientists, and yet I would say in the last four years since I've been doing this, maybe even five now, um, I've met a lot of women who are scientists. This is a great opportunity for your gender to learn why the plant does what it does when it interacts with our endocannabinoid system. Are you starting to see younger women wanting to go to maybe some of these colleges that are now teaching cannabis botany, if you will, and not to mention the cannabis laws and all that, but but how to grow it and, and more importantly, how to test what's inside that female flower that uh, people do enjoy. Yeah, no, absolutely. And I think the cannabis industry, there's science, but it's a wide field. If you want to be a lawyer, there's cannabis law, there's economics, there's all these. It's it's really a blue ocean for me of possibilities. Um, but at the end of the day, I think what is really important is the intent or the, the drive from uh, the corporation to hire, to actively recruit women. And, and that's always something I kept an eye on. I remember when we were building our cultivation team, we were looking for some of these young women that would be coming from local colleges and really work in horticulture and have a love for the plant. And it took us a year before we could find one or even get applicants. So I think it's also about making it known that this is an, there's an opportunity. It's okay to, to apply to this position. You can bring so much. Right, namely when you come out of college, think about possibilities abound, but also making sure on the other side that the, the companies and the corporation are actively, deliberately recruiting for some women and, and looking for this diversity. Yeah, and, 
And I'm gonna I'm gonna ask one more, Brooke. You hold your thoughts about that subject because we'll come back to it when we open up when we have more people on our our panel. But I do want to go back to uh, something that is tied to acreage holdings that I still maintain probably had more of an impact on the acceptance and normalization than a lot of people because when John Boehner decided to get involved and he mm -hmm. went from the Speaker of the House to acreage holdings, everybody went, whoa, mm -hmm. this, this is going to happen. It, there was like a sense of uh, acceptance and legitimacy, perhaps, at the very beginning. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, we're, we're definitely a company of firsts, whether it's the Super Bowl ads or John Boehner, we're, that's one of our signature moves. Well, I've got something for you. We'll talk about it afterwards. Uh, that, that would be the first too, but let's not go there for now. I just want to thank Patricia Rossi for joining us here on a Friday afternoon, the Chief Marketing Officer of Acreage Holdings. We've got a full show, all women. And by the way, you you might notice that none of my male guest hosts are <laughs> on this show because you know if I can control the production, I'm going to surround myself with smart, beautiful women. And I'm very happy to say we're off to a great start. So Patricia, thank you so much again for joining us. Best to Jacques, your husband. And we're going to take a break because we just missed our 420 window a little bit. But we come back with more Women in Cannabis on Green Rush Live. Don't go away. Yeah, this is a, a tune that uh, I wrote back in 19... <laughs> I've forgotten. We had a saying in our old, old band, one of my first bands in 1966 or so, what are you going to do tonight? Oh, just... You know, like every other night, just gonna lay around the shanty and put a good buzz on. <laughs> gonna sit down in the kitchen, fix me something good to eat. Make my head a little high, make the whole day complete. Gonna lay around the shanty all mama and put a good buzz on. Pass it to me, baby, pass it to me slow. We'll take time out to smile a little before you let her go. We gonna lay around the shanty all mama and put a good buzz on. Or something go ahead Rick Brodsky everybody I'm not doing it all in room for more. Fill it, light it, shut up and close that door, baby. We're gonna lay around the shanty, mama, and put a good buzz on. Take it, okay. never works it's time to realize it it grows in my backyard it's time to legalize it we're gonna lay around the shed and mama and put a good buzz on
sit down in my rented car. I'm going to jam it into drive. I'm going to head on out and play at WSCA with Sean. I'm glad I'm alive. We're going to lay around the shanty mama and put a good buzz on every night and day. We're going to lay around the shanty mama and put a good buzz on. Nice. It's Friday. Thank God. Thank God Jonathan Edwards is joining us live in the WSCA studios. So for years, we've been doing manufacturing, financial services, uh, medical, and so forth on businesses that stand alone from doctor's offices to day traders to, um, to even small banks. And so when cannabis came along, all of the tools, skills, and miscellaneous that we learned in there, we were able to apply it for them. And for us, it wasn't that big of a, of a problem or a challenge. It, it worked great. And so um, they just needed a reporting feature in one software. And uh, luckily, that the software company came through for us, came it, came it back, and now it's become the, the backbone for our offerings. And uh, it uh, it's worked out incredibly well. And- And welcome back to Green Rush Live for a Friday afternoon here on Pro Cannabis Media. We do this every Friday at 4 p.m. I am the founder of Pro Cannabis Media, Jimmy Young, and I'm so happy to be talking about women in cannabis today. That's our theme, and Brooke Westlake has agreed to be my guest host for the entire two hours, so I really appreciate that. She, of course, is the founder and CEO of the Women in Cannabis Expo, but now now we're really going to meet some movers and shakers, if you will, that are in the cannabis space and from all over the country, I might add. And I'm going to start, I'm going to, okay, just, this has nothing to do with favoritism, okay? I am going to start with with Thunder Walker, because first of all, the name is freaking awesome. The hairdo, unbelievable. I need to know, I need to know who you are and what you are about. Go, Thunder, go. Well, thanks for being here. I'm so glad to be here today. Um, What I actually do in cannabis, I started out in real estate uh, when I was 18 years old. And so I did everything to do with real estate and construction. So I started up Women Pushing Dirt because I wanted to go into areas that uh, were not thriving. But what I realized on those corners, there were people pushing more than dirt. So they wanted to know what I was doing on there. And I was like, I'm, I'm rehabbing properties and everything. So I named my company Women Pushing Dirt. So I'm the founder and CEO. And then I uh, learned a lot on those different corners and I moved into the cannabis space. And so uh, I took my real estate uh, knowledge and I became a cannabis appraiser. And I do evaluations for cannabis businesses and I help people start up cannabis businesses across the country through Proud Mary Holdings and Proud Mary Cannabis. I'm also a public speaker and I'm a can of mom. I love that. My daughter is a cannabis patient and uh, I just really, really advocate for people with special needs or mental health issues that use cannabis for medicine. Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Um, next up, uh, Jillian Xavier from Dreglow Cannabis Testing Labs. And I got to tell you, the testing labs have come under the microscope, pardon the, you know, kind of pun there, uh, over the last couple of months, more and more stories about, oh, this testing, you know, we've got to do better jobs with the testing. Tell us how you got into it and how challenging a job it is in the space you're in. So I got into cannabis uh, because my son, uh, DeAndre, at 18 years old, <clears throat> became my angel. So the company is named Dre Glow because now he's my shining light. He's the reason that I'm pushing forward. And also because I didn't want to get on the pharmaceuticals. They were telling me if I take this, I'll hallucinate. I'm like, who's doing that? I'll just smoke some cannabis and I will be good to go. And that's what I need. That's the medicine I use. You know, Um, getting into testing is exactly what you just said. There's no integrity on the market, right? Mm -hmm. I am social equity with the city of Long Beach. I am the first woman to open a testing lab in the city. There are four labs in the city, all owned by males. So um, 
And I'm also from the island of Trinidad and Tobago. I want to make sure I say that because, you know, my grandma would be like, you didn't mention us. Um, <laughs> so I'm in this business because I really believe in the science and, and it really has helped me. Um, I also have products. I have CBD products and hemp seed products on Amazon. So I'm constantly trying to do things with integrity as well. It's a tough business. It's a tough space. Um, I'm still in my license phase with the state and the city, you know, one hand washes the other. So it's, it's, it's a tough space to get into because I can't hold any more licenses, but integrity is why I'm here. Very cool. Very cool. Very cool. All right. And last but not least is Melody Irfani, the director of marketing. And I hope I pronounced your last name right. Good job. Yes, you did. <laughs> you know, as I, I, I teach enunciation, pronunciation, inflection, and cadence in my oral communication course. <laughs> oh, believe me, when I don't ask for a person's name, how to pronounce it first, I'm always like, oh, I hope I got it right. Tell us about what the uh, Cannabis Technology Partners are all about and how do you market that? Yeah, so um, we actually started in uh, 2012 as a company, um, IT service company that does, that basically acts as a company's internal IT department. Uh, we started out in uh, healthcare. So um, there's a lot of crossovers. So about three years ago, we did our um, sub-branding of Cannabis Technology Partners, and uh, we focus on dispensaries, uh, manufacturing, and grow facilities. So um, we are there for the strategy side of it. A lot of new companies coming in needing to know what technology, what software, you know. Um, so we work with startups all the way to already established businesses and do everything from help desk to um, surveillance monitoring and putting up your video surveillance. So yeah. Gotcha. There you go. All right, Brooke, take over. <laughs> well, ladies. I would like you all to share with us maybe one of the most memorable moments in being in the cannabis space. It could be a positive or a negative, but something that's really just stuck out to you that you've taken it and you've run with it in either way. Like you, maybe it was a policy that was in place and you got the policy changed. So give us one of those examples, share with everybody because you guys know as well as I do, it's very hard for us to be in this space and we're always constantly learning. There's no golden book on how to do things. So let's start with Melody. Okay, so the first thing that jumped to my mind, um, and this might be very uh, sucking up, Brooke, but oh well. <laughs> um, you know, the people that I've met in this industry and the women that I've met in this industry, um, part, you know, majority and uh, through you, Brooke, uh, through the Women in Cannabis Expos and those conferences, um, I think it is very rare to have such entrepreneurs also take such good care of each other and to be um, mentors and sounding boards and um, really support each other. So, so going into this industry, um, I've been grateful for that. And so uh, that's what kind of popped into my mind. So yeah, thanks for facilitating that. <laughs> You're welcome. Miss uh, Jillian, what would you say? I think for me, you know, for being a part of the social equity uh, entrepreneurs with the city of Long Beach is really the fight and being able to attain uh, a location grant because they wanted us to find a location, then come get a grant. Landlord is like, I need my money up front, boo. So it's, 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 it's actually fighting, fighting to get that done, getting it done and actually get that grant was a moment when I said, okay, I can really stand up and fight and speak up for social equity and for myself and things can get done with with you know with a movement of people helping you with uh, women in cannabis expo and being able to speak being a legacy sponsor with melody and thunder and all of us there the upliftment the energy in the room was fire you know what i mean and that's what keeps you going you know i heard the past speakers talk about resilience and you know what women have and that's what we have is that resilience to keep going in the storm and out of the storm you know what i mean in the season and the right season till we catch the right season you know so that's mm -hmm. what's yeah women in cannabis uh expo for sure big kudos to you Brooke. oh 
That's nice. Okay, Miss Thunder, you're up. All right. Well, absolutely, it's the Women Cannabis Expo. Um, <laughs> the first time, uh, but I'm going to give you two because I, you know, so we'll have some more information. But the first time I ever spoke on can on cannabis at an event was the Women Cannabis Expo, and it was an amazing, amazing time. It was in New Jersey. I was very nervous. I was coming out of a difficult situation, and the support there was just truly fire it was and then to be able to share my story and then to come back and win woman on the rise in cannabis for the east coast i left that event feeling on fire i left that event feeling uh, a new form of life and a new passion and i was able to connect all of the dots in my life whether it was good or bad all the things that i've learned in real estate and in cannabis and move forward then I wanted to project a image of myself out to the public that they would understand that this wasn't just a one time fluke. I wanted to be able to open the door for other women. And so I formed Proud Mary Holdings while I was in New Jersey at that particular event because I realized there was just a lot of women coming up and they were scared. They, were, they didn't really understand what was needed. And what's mm -hmm. amazing about the United States of America is everything that is needed is in real estate. So I was able to connect those dots for those women and open a door for them. So uh, just being able to see more and more women come through the door from the expo and now even into the future, it's been a couple of years since that uh, first initial meeting and conversation that I had with Brooke. But her particular conversation, the start of that conversation, the first email uh, has opened the door and Brooke doesn't know this probably has opened the door for maybe hundreds and hundreds of women where I actually go and speak or I help them set up businesses. And that was that first initial conversation. Um, I'm not sure if you know Brooke's background, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about her. Nothing really personal, but she uh, was a beauty contestant um, and she uses that style and that grace to be able to show women that they can step on stage and perform at the highest level uh, and we really don't give that enough credit we really don't show enough applause for that because it takes grace to be able to stand in front of people and talk about your issues your concern and still learn and go around the table and, and learn from other people and so that was the biggest thing for me launching a career and helping other people launch a career based off of my first conversation and meeting all the ladies on this panel so here we are <laughs> and the rest Trans is history transfer say. transferable skills um i don't I, again i probably should have done my due diligence to find out how many of you are actually parents of children okay that that being said the tough that is by far for any parent out there we all know it is absolutely the hardest job any of us ever have there's no training for it you know god gives you actually excuse me the woman gives you a child okay all we do is cause it again you know men are just useless except for no i'm only kidding uh, but seriously uh, i have learned and i have tremendous respect for single parents because you take away that dynamic of uh, a team of two people in a relationship and you take that dynamic away and now you are the boss. Oh, by the way, and you have to do it. This is what I've been taught is moms don't have a choice. You have to take care of your children as opposed to the partner. And I'm not even going to put a gender on that one. The partner, okay, who has an opportunity to not take care of that child because they'll, they'll have to go do something else, whether they, you know, traditionally it's the breadwinner. Well, you know what? That's, that's changed quite a bit. Okay. Uh, certainly. So I, I guess my, my question about the transferable skills, what are the transferable skills as a woman and as a mother that you bring to the business arena? And Brooke, you get to go first on that. Wow. That I love that question. So I think, from the transferable skills of being a mom. Like you said, there's no book. I have two boys, uh, 13 and four. Um, They're both like the loves of my life. I will say my oldest one is my challenging one. He's the one who keeps me on 
the cusp. And I think I relate that to business. Like business is always transitioning and changing and you're on the cusp all the time, especially in this industry because the policies change and things you can and can't do marketing. My youngest one is so full of love. And so he, he brings me back to center of like, why I do what I do, why I love women, why I love helping them constantly. Even after our shows, these ladies will tell you when an opportunity of business comes up, I'll connect people behind the scenes. Oh, you shouldn't, you need to talk to Jimmy and Hey, do you want to be on the show? You know, Jimmy will reach out. I'll be like, I've got ladies who do you need to talk to? So those are probably the two most um, things. And I'll, I'll leave you guys with a little funny thing. So my oldest son, who's going to be 13 said to me one day, Hey mom, I have a penis. What's your superpower? And I said, I grow babies. And I was like, drop the mic. That's my superpower. And he was like, ah, so not fair. And I was like, well, sorry. Like, can't compete with us women, but there you go. (laughs) Good life lesson early. I got to tell you. And he's just becoming 13, right? So (laughs) wait wait three more years. That's all I can tell you is just wait three more years. The 16-year-old male is is a challenge, let's just say. Um, (laughs) All right, Thunder, yeah. tell, tell us about your, your world and, and how challenging and what kind of transferable skills you bring from the, the domestic situation, perhaps, to uh, the business world. Well, I have several children that I actually gave birth to, and then I have some that just call me mom. And what's interesting about those transferable skills is being a mother to a person that you gave birth to and you've known all of their lives versus someone that just attaches themselves to you is that you have to learn really, really quickly what sets that particular person off. What's their flavor? Uh, What is the thing that makes them happy or brings them down and how to lift them back up again. And that transfers into the cannabis space. Really it transfers to any business space because you're constantly selling and I'm constantly selling my children. I'm constantly selling other people in Uh, what I do in this industry, not just selling cannabis, but selling my skills, selling a product, selling uh, to politicians, why this uh, plant is so special. Uh, That's so, so important when you're able to sit down and talk to someone and recognize what's in it for them. And children, they tell you really quick, What's in it for them, you know, they're with them. What's in it for them, that's the only thing they're interested in. And sometimes you have to do the same thing when you are going in and lobbying for something that you truly believe in, whether it's for special education, whether it's for women, or whether it is for the plant. Very cool. Okay, next next is Jillian. Well, for me, I would say what I've learned um, raising an 18 year old is his fearlessness, you know, and I and and that's what I transfer into, you know, being able to go down to the city and sit for two hours to talk to three minutes to try to explain to them why we need to get the grant to get up and running. I get that motivation from him, you know, because he was just like, look, I'm living and I'm living, mom, you know what I mean? And I could appreciate that looking forward now you know and I go along I go forward with him and and just you know I I keep coming back to just wanting to do right because at the end of the day right I prefer my son over millions of dollars right but if I can bless somebody and change a life I have a foundation I've created for him I can bless somebody and change a life and say hey this is not the world let me show you the world he traveled a lot for 18 years he traveled every year I I'm a traveling spirit as well I want to be able to build up the community and say, look, this is not, this is not life. You know what I mean? Let's go to Ibiza, Spain somewhere, you know, some, somewhere you never heard of. So that's my mission. And that's what I transfer is his fearlessness to come on, mom, you can do this. I, b- I believe there's an amazing resort called Marbella on the Southern part of Spain. Am I come right? Come on now. I have not. I have not been there. I've just heard amazing things. Come on about to the that. universe now. Come on now. All right, and <laughs> Melody, Melody, again, tell us uh, any transferable skills in your world uh, from home to work. Well, um, I'm not a mom, but I am a theater artist. So I uh, write and direct. And so I've created two plays. And those are kind of my children. My sweat, blood, tears, soul have gone into them. And I think the transferable skills are um, 
something that you're passionate about and that creativity um, can go through all aspects of your life. Um, and when you attach joy to it, um, then it doesn't become as hard. There are hardships through whatever at home life or, or business life, but um, being present and um, finding the, the beauty in it uh, goes a long way and this is the third this is the third baby this is my, i was going to ask you me of my joy you are a mom <laughs> yeah i'm a dog mom <laughs> yes. yes i was like i know right <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's great all right so now i got a question and it was i did not create this question it came from a female that's in my life. Okay, I'm, I'm making, I'm giving credit. I'm, you know, I'm attributing this question because it's a really good one. And I think every one of you is going to be able to identify with this. In your experience in business, are there any examples you can share about instances that would never have happened if you were a man? <laughs> I knew. Oh, that, I'm sure I, how many? How many are going? How many yeah. are going through your mind right now? Right. <laughs> That's right. Brooke, just I'm trying to find right. real estate. Just, yeah, okay. trying to, just trying yeah. to find real estate and walking into the door and they look at me and they're like, okay, Jillian Xavier, they say Xavier or Xavier. So it sounds like it might be a white person, uh, you know, a Caucasian person. So when they walk in, they're already shocked. They're like, hmm. And, and it's like, okay, so is the business yours or are you coming to represent somebody else? I'm sorry. Is the business yours or am I, I'm sorry, is the business yours or am I, call, am I here to represent somebody else? And I'm like, no, it's my business. So the real estate part of it, of uh, being discriminated against, I guess, you know, and yeah, you're, you're a woman, you're not, you know. Right. Hold on. Where's your male partner? Right. But, by the way, that doesn't, that doesn't matter anymore. No. Right. <laughs> Right. I mean, come on. We have we have progressed a little bit despite our leadership. That's the only political statement I'm going to make. Okay. And I mean, the leadership over the last 20 years. Let's throw them all under the bus. Okay. Really? Because what <laughs> happens too much, and you've already mentioned this, guys, um, is labeling, finger pointing, and blame. It just that that doesn't help. It just doesn't help. Um, anybody else want to throw in some examples? Come on, there are good stories out there. Go ahead. I have a, a complete example, and I agree with you, Jillian. Real estate is that frontier. I've had over, oh God, 40 years worth of real estate experience, real estate appraiser, mortgage loan officer, closer, uh, real estate broker, com construction builder, all of those things. And um, I've set up commercial properties, own commercial properties. Real estate is the issue when it comes to women and trying to lease a property and or maintain a property. So I leased my property, um, that one of my properties that I use, and um, the landlord will only speak to my male partner. And so... Um, <laughs> He will only speak. He will only take rent from the male partner. He, it's just, you know, it's oblivious. But for it's me, um, I have bigger fish to fry. And uh, I intend to be successful regardless. So, you know, I understand that that is an issue. And that's why I teach on cannabis real estate. I teach on the green zone. Uh, we have signed a long lease. And so I won't let anyone interrupt me from being successful and from my business being successful. But you find those people out there that own commercial properties in a green zone and they only want to talk to men. And that's really, really, really still happening. Yeah, that's sexist. We all know the word for it. OK, um, yeah. for, um, go ahead, uh, Melody. Um, you know, it's little instances of when um, you're talking and then uh, talking over, our, especially since I'm in technology. Um, and though I am not the person doing the technology, I've been in this technology business for quite a few years, um, not believing, oh, no, you, you don't know what you're talking about. And I'm like, well, 
do. <laughs> um, so I, I guess it's the being taken seriously is kind of just in a very general situation. And I can think of a couple instances. And so um, it's about, again, kind of what Thunder said, what battles are you going to fight? You can't change. Uh, what's your energy? You know, right. if it's going to be someone I'm, um, that I'm constantly dealing with, yes, maybe a conversation is needed. Or if it's just a this one-time interaction, it, it, my energy is, is better put somewhere else. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Brooke, go ahead. Yep. I will say that um, both times I was pregnant, I was challenged by men if I would return to work. The second time I was challenged, I was in graduate school at 37 years old and found out I was pregnant with my second last child. And the dean was like, well, if you need more time. And I was like, I got businesses to open. I'll be done in a year and a half. And they were like, okay. And that was nice that they were in some way like trying to be considerate, but I was like, I have a mission. I will say this, having the Women in Cannabis Expo, I have had males reach out to me and they have said, oh, we probably can't attend your event because we're male. And I say, no, we want you there. If you're a spouse of someone, boyfriend, supporter, uh, even if you work with women in the industry, please come and support us. Yes, we are women centric. No, we do not exclude men from being a part of our events. We want you guys there to uh, invest in women-owned companies, see what other women are doing. How can you help them? Who can you connect them with and network with? So we welcome men in our space. Even though it says Women in Cannabis Expo, men are welcome to participate with our event. And we've given away a couple awards to males. And we've had some phenomenal mayor, male sponsors. So we, we thank you guys. We want to work collaboratively with you, uh, but we still, our majority is uplifting women in the business. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to guess that the men that are there enjoy the ratio. I just want to say, because, <laughs> right? I mean, <laughs> not that I, not you know, wrong, Jimmy, you're that, not wrong. I, ha I happen to have been at a Women in Cannabis <laughs> conference in, in Vegas in 2019, and I think there was maybe a dozen males to 300 women in there. So <laughs> let's just say... Uh, we enjoyed ourselves. Um, I got to tell you, this was great, but but I have to ask a question of Thunder, okay? Because I got to know about the hair, okay? I have got to know how long did it take you to grow that? How much upkeep do you have to have? I mean, is it is it is it a burden? I guess would be the question. It is not a burden. Okay, so uh, I've been wearing my hair natural since 1991. They're actual dreads, and as they grow out, uh, and it's loose dreads. And what that means is there's no combing, there's no messing with. I have a, a hairdresser that does it once a month and just gets it refreshed. Um, but no, this is it, guys. This is it. I'm going to start my speeches off like that from now on. When I'm publicly speaking, I'm going to start that conversation it's, from the beginning because right. I always get that. You can say, but it's not the, a hair, the hair is real, and so am I. You know, that's how you write it. That's right. Right? That's right. So deal deal yeah. with that. Hey, listen, uh, this, this was great. And I know that the next two half hours now, we've set the bar pretty high with, with already a, a, the first good hour here. But we have two people that are coming on in just a few minutes that are two of the most influential women in the cannabis industry they're always on the high times lists. And, and one is Jamie Pearson and the other is Sunday Seafried. And they're both going to be joining us after this break. But I want to thank Thunder, Melody, and Jillian uh, for joining us here this half hour. And I hope you will continue to like, share, and subscribe to the pro cannabis media world that's out there because we, we, we welcome everybody in our world. Okay. Thank you for having us. You bet. Thank we're going to take it. We're going to take another break, quick break, and we'll be back on the other side uh, with more of Green Rush Live on the Women in Cannabis themed show. Don't go away. So for years, we've been doing manufacturing, financial services, uh, medical, and so forth on businesses that stand alone from doctor's offices to day traders to um, to even small banks. And so when cannabis came along, all of the tools, skills, and miscellaneous that we learned in there, we were able to apply it for them. And for us, it wasn't that big of a, of a problem or a challenge. It, it worked great. And so um, they just needed a reporting feature in one software. And 
Uh, luckily, that the software company came through for us, came it, came it back, and now it's become the the backbone for our offerings, and uh, it uh, it's worked out incredibly well. Technology. I'll never understand yeah, it. I'll never it like it, but I'll play in it. All right, Sunday, uh, tell us how Safe Harbor Financial is doing. And is it all doom and gloom out there in the cannabis industry? That's all we hear about now. Yeah, I, you know, I don't think so. I, Good. you know, I, we deal with a lot of companies and I, and there's a lot of new companies getting new licenses. And I, I see a lot of thriving markets out there. I think what we're seeing is, um, competitive forces that are forcing somewhat natural correction in the market. But, I mean, even if you take Colorado as an example, people used to fly to Colorado to buy all their cannabis and take their vacations and now they're not doing it. So you're seeing just a natural correction as these other states actually legalize. There's not a need to come all the way to Colorado to do it anymore. So I, um, and I think the, the other thing is, is the new entrants coming into the market have bigger advantages than those who pioneered prior to. And they have, they have um, the advantage of a lot of knowledge out there, a lot of talented people, you know, they don't have to reinvent the wheel. So I think those fast followers that we're seeing in the other states, they just have a lot more uh, resources available to them to succeed. There you go. Brooke, I know you have questions for both of these people, so I'm gonna allow you to take over. Well, thank you. So I'm going to start with Sunday, and then this one will also go to Jamie as well. What inspired you to be in the banking part of cannabis? It's such a it's it can be such a frustration point when individuals or companies go into this space. Uh, you know, usually they'll go down to their family bank. That's what I did uh, to get my account open, and they said yeah, we can do it. And then all of a sudden, as it went up to the higher chains of command and they figured out, you know, they had a discussion, they said, no, we can't, we can't touch you. It's like a 10 foot pole. So what inspired you to go into the banking aspect of cannabis for cannabis businesses? Well, I think you remember that I, I was going to retirement in 2014 yeah. and yes. then suddenly this just landed on my plate and you know, the board was concerned I was going to start the project and leave. And I really said, it's only going to be a five-year project. We'll talk about a five-year contract, but that really changed. But it, it really boiled down to one thing, you know, somebody had to do it. They had to do it right. And it was the right thing to do, you know, leaving an industry out there that was legalized, didn't have access to banking. There was nobody in my research that didn't want this money to be accountable and reported correctly. So it was the right thing to do. Even if there was the fear of prosecution, it's still based upon everything I heard. It was a risk that I thought was a calculated risk worth taking. But I think the, the driving force was, you know, the safety factor in the community. And it was the right thing to do to protect, you know, Colorado and the businesses. I love that. And we appreciate that so much because you're right. There is the safety aspect. And if you didn't do it, we we needed you led the way in your leadership of doing that. And thank you for not retiring and staying on board <laughs> so that these companies could have banking because it's such a pain point. Uh, my question for Jamie is you've had some a lot of experience with I think you said this is your third business that you have opened mm -hmm. in the cannabis space. What inspired mm -hmm. you to open this third entity? How is it going? And what's been your favorite highlight so far of going and having this new Holland group that you've created? One of the things I loved about working at Bang was, you know, going, uh, taking the brand across state lines and across borders, um, you know, in the industry where, you're still in prohibition and you can't, um, I can't just manufacture chocolate in one place and then ship it across state lines. I had to have essentially 50 different relationships and a relationship in each country. Um, what I realized was um, the work that I did in investing in real estate was really beneficial uh, in, in bringing a lot of those, you know, creating the relationships and finding the commonalities in the rules so that we could have efficiencies across all of those differences. Um, and what I realized after doing that for seven years is that there are a lot of 
people out there that um, have had their head down, have been focused on rightly so whatever it was that they were working on and then realized, okay, well now I'm ready for expansion and they're at the beginning of that process and I could actually make it easier for them, uh, sort of help them leapfrog that learning curve. Um, and in a former life, before I was a real estate investor, I was a middle school teacher. Um, I have a master's degree in education and you know, did a lot of curriculum design work um, and was a college professor at the University of Oregon. So teaching's in my blood. And I was just fortunate enough to be in a position where I could pick and choose what I wanted to do. And helping people has always been um, you know, near and dear to my heart. It's what makes me tick, so to speak. So starting a consultancy and using my hard-won knowledge and experience to help others was really just a natural fit. Yeah. You mentioned uh, you're, you're related somehow to Cypress Hill. Did I hear a cousin or something? Yeah, DJ Muggs um, from Cypress Hill is my first cousin. Yeah. Okay, so he was in Boston for NECAN, as was your other friend, Jim Belushi. Just, yep. you know, and just one. I did not go to Cypress Hill, but I did. Uh, hang out with Jim for a little while. I didn't get a, a private moment with him, but you know what? That was okay too. I, I will tell you, I did have fun when I walked into the room that he was in and we were live streaming the interview that we had done with him back in 2022. And I said, look, who's on my network right now? You know, it's always kind of fun to do that. Um, yeah. I do want to ask a question here about access to capital. Okay. Because I think really and truly that is one of the most important things for any startup in pretty much any industry, but in cannabis, it's extra hard. And, you know, as I started off saying it's doom and gloom Sunday to you, I, you know, I, I'm, I was just kind of prompting it because I, I follow the news and I see what's going on. I don't understand it, but I follow it. Okay. <laughs> so Sunday, explain to me how challenging it is as a female to have access to that, the, to the man who has all that capital, and how do you break down that that ceiling, or however that you guys, how do you do that? Well, that's a real good question. I, I think first and foremost, I think that you know investment banking and access to capital is still a man's world. Okay. I just finished forty-two investor meetings over four days in four different cities. And there were only three meetings in which women were attending and were decision makers. So I think the first thing we want to do is see more women who have taken interest and in other women who are getting into business. But the primary thing is if you've got a good business model, if you present it correctly, if you really fine tune your story and you meet projections and you show them that you're going to succeed and their money is going to be well placed, that's the first thing you have to do going in there. But I think. Um, I haven't run into a lot of problems at this point in time in terms of getting people to buy into the story. And, and I think that's fortunate for Safe Harbor Financial simply because we're indirectly working with the cannabis industry and financial services is one of those staples that every business is always going to need. So I think again, it boils down to, to business model, but it would be really great to see more women in the investment world. Yeah, and, and, and Jamie, I mean, back in Cannabis 1.0, when you started bang there were women there was some over 20 percent of women that were in the industry and now that that has dwindled down is it because of what sunday just described is the boardrooms are still filled with men well first i want to clarify i didn't start bang it was five Sorry. years old when i went to work there so you know just want to you don't want to take credit for something i didn't do um there were a lot more women when I first started and, um, you know, there's, there's a whole bunch of societal elements that are coming into play right now. I think, you know, I'm just not a big believer that there's some nefarious, um, you know, conspiracy to exclude women. I, I do believe that, um, we know that, you know, less than one cent out of every dollar of investment funds is going towards, um, women or people of color who are starting companies. Um, and I think part of that, and, I, and I've said this before out on the speaking circuit, is that we generally defer to the, the people that we're comfortable with, to our own sort of sphere of influence, if you will. And so if the 
power and money and influence rests with white men, they're not rubbing their hands together going, yay, we're going to exclude everybody, but they are going to um, hear the deals across their desk from the people they golf with and the people they're on the board with. And it always continues to be this who looks like me, sounds like me, talked like me, went to my college. Um, you know, here's my son. He's a great kid. You should give him an internship. And it, it just becomes kind of an insular situation. And the only way we can really break out of that is with intentionality. And so if you take it to an extreme, you're asking the master to dismantle his own house. But if you really, you know, I generally believe that most people are good. Um, and I think that they just have to be thinking about that. And I always say when I'm investing, I know that women and people of color have to work harder, have to be smarter, um, have to be prepared to get as far as their white male counterparts. Um, and I'm not a man hater at all. Um, I just know that I've, I cannot show up late. I cannot show up unprepared because I'm going to be held to a higher standard. I'm aware of that. And so I know that other people are as well, which leads me to believe that when someone that's a female or a person of color has made it to a certain point, they're probably really smart and prepared and detail oriented and have all the right stuff. And they're probably going to make a really great investment for me and my dollars. So I try with intentionality as an accredited investor to place my capital in those arenas. So I've made investments in garden society, women owned, women founded company, Sava, women owned, women founded, queer owned company. I'm doing that intentionally with my dollar, both just out of a social justice um, passion, but also because I, I find these people to be awesome operators. And uh, so anyway, I just think that the way that we can get there is through being intentional about what we do. I, I, I agree 100% with that. Uh, Brooke, um, do you want to add in something here? Yeah, I love that Jamie touched on that because it would be lovely if more, I think, companies approached with that kind of outlook and they looked at the woman-owned companies and uh, the minority-owned companies and say, like, I know they're going to work harder. And so that's always something that I encourage males that come to our events, like, spend some money, invest in these women-owned businesses. If you hear a, a company that you really like, like, go and put your money there for them because they need the help and we can't do it unless we all come together as a team. So what's been, I think for both of you guys being in these industries that are obviously very male dominant and uh, especially with banking, I would say is extremely male dominant. What's been the most highlighted, positive, inspirational thing that you have come across in being in these spaces and what has been like maybe the best compliment a male counterpart has given you in being in the roles that you guys are each in, in your businesses? Do you want me to go first? Okay. Yes, I'll have Sunday to go first, yes. <laughs> you know, first of all, I'm really gonna have to rack my brain on some compliment. <laughs> that doesn't happen a lot. But you know, I, I, I have to agree that, you know, I, I'm not a man hater either. And as, as many times as I can remember the wrong thing being said to me, I can also remember the, the male influences I did have in my career. Very early in my career, I had a gentleman that I worked for at, at a credit union and he started talking to me about the Peter principle. And I was like, oh my gosh, I've just never heard about that before. And and then I'm like, how do you know you're getting there, right? And then we kind of dissected that. And I said, oh, gee, you ever had that feeling about me? He looked right at me. And I, this was so impacting. I still remember. And I was only 23 years old, <laughs> long time ago. And he said, <laughs> I don't think you're ever going to hit your Peter principle. You know, so there were as, you know, good influences as the ones who looked right at me and said, well, that's why I hire women. They work harder. <laughs> You know, but that's what they keep them. And I have to agree that mentoring and grooming, you know, we're, we're now in that place where it matters. Standards have changed in the workplace. You cannot minimize women or people of color at this point in time. That standard has changed. And I think we're going to see a lot more of that mentoring and grooming and, and moving up through the organization just because the standards of the workplace have changed in the last five years. 
And you know, I think, kudos so, to I think I want to add to that though. I think that um, I'm tr I try to be careful with the, the concept of grooming and mentoring, because one of the things I've realized is as I've gotten deep, deep into the industry at, at a high level is that um, what a lot of women and people of color need isn't grooming or mentoring. It's just access to money. Um, you know, and, and it's almost, um, I would say offensive to some of them like, oh, well, let me mentor you. Um, and I, a, a great example comes to mind. I got invited and in, introduced to a woman, um, at a fundraising event and, um, the person that introduced us was like, oh, Jamie, you've been so successful. I think you'd be a great mentor for this woman. And she was very kind and gracious and we met and it was wonderful. And then come to find out she was the head of real estate for Home Depot and had, I mean, she had hold giant jobs, could run circles around me, definitely didn't need me to mentor her. She just needed money and kept running into these roadblocks. And, um, you know, so then what, what my role was, was not to you know, pat her on the head and, and not, Sunny, that's not what I'm saying you're saying, but, you know, I didn't want to be like, oh, here's what you need to be doing and mentoring, or it was just simply a matter of opening up my Rolodex and saying, this woman's amazing. Uh, her business plan is amazing. This is a no brainer. And, and, you know, if you aren't thinking about investing in this woman, you need to ask yourself, why do you have a hidden bias? And sort of putting people a little bit on the spot for them to question whether or not they have that hidden bias, because there would be no reason for her not to be able to raise capital. Her plan is, it, all of it makes sense. Um, secured by real estate, there really just wasn't a reason for her not to be able to raise capital, but she's really struggling. And then that's when you kind of face those institutional biases and personal biases um, and that's when our job, rather than sort of mentoring and grooming, but sort of advocating uh, comes into play. You know, can I just tag on? So I think it's the difference in perspective that we're talking about here. So I had to recently uh, for NASDAQ determine how many women were in my organization. So I went all the way through it. People of color, people of women, you had to give them the statistics. And 47% of my workforce is women. 47% of my management team is women. So when I'm talking about mentoring and grooming, I'm talking about bringing them up through the ranks in the workplace and, and giving beautiful. them that opportunity yeah. more, more so than and access to capital. Yeah, yeah, yeah. beautiful. Yeah. There you go. Brooke, did you have something to add here? Because that, that... I will say, I you know, I, um, I love mentorship. I have mentored people. I've been asked to do some consulting for the cannabis side. But I've also been mentored by some very amazing, strong men. And I feel very fortunate with that, too, because I've always kind of sought out mentorship from both males and females to get me where I need to go. I've always kept older, wiser people in my life for that reason. And I even had a friend say to me, like, you have a lot of older people in your life. And I said, yes, they've lived. They've experienced some stuff. And I don't want to necessarily make some of those same mistakes. And I love, I love getting mentored. Uh, I will say the access to capital has been a pressure point. Um, one of my main, main people is a male that has supported my, my business for the past three years. And I feel so honored that he lets me go and do my thing. And then I get to share with him what I've done. And then if I feel like I'm stuck somewhere and I'm like, this isn't working, what should I try? He'll give me ideas, but he's like, you, you go shine, you go do you, um, but it's been, it's been, I feel, I've gotten a very shared, blessed model when it comes to that. I get that UBU thing from my life partner a lot. I just want to say, you know, just, I think she's given up. No, only kidding. I, guys, uh, this has been great. I, I want to throw one thing out at you, and we're, we're up against it, so I'm, I'm just going to wrap this up. But there's a book out there that changed my perspective on gender. And I've talked about it on my show before, and maybe I've mentioned it to, to Jamie, but the book is called The Macho Paradox, and it's by a guy named Jackson Katz, who I had the honor of interviewing uh, when I was a sportscaster in Boston in the 90s, and he was involved with the Sport and Society Center at Northeastern University. And it's all about 
the, the how there are differences between men and women, and men, if they're going to actually make a difference, have to call on other men to change how they think, as opposed to waiting for the women to make that point to the man. And you know, on, and then of course there's a paradox. You know, the man in in history is supposed to be the breadwinner and the the strong one, and and you know controls all the capital and all this, and. I don't know about you. I, I, they've said it. I think the white, the old white man has screwed up this country since we got here in, in the 17th century. I mean, look what we did to the Native Americans for crying out loud when we got here, right? And then, of course, they started to take the land, my real estate investor friends on this call, okay? So it is, uh, it, it's time. It, I really would like to live to see the day where we have female leadership. And I know we almost did. Okay, I know we almost did, and I don't want to get into politics and lie and all this stuff, but it is time. It really is time to make changes in our world, and I really hope that at some point we'll we'll see this in my lifetime. But Jamie Pearson, I don't need to tell you how much I love you, okay? Because mm. you know, thank you for coming on. And Sunday, it, it you know every time you come on, you say something that I remember, which is unto itself, isn't it? <laughs> okay. And I really appreciate um, you taking the time because I know this was a short kind of turnaround for you. So thank you for that too. No, I just want to say much. it was nice to meet you, Brooke. I've followed you from afar on Sunday. Uh, Sunday, I've been a fangirl from afar. We've never met, but I mean, what you've accomplished is incredible. And anyway, I'm happy to have shared a screen with you. Oh, well, thank you. It was great to You're meet so you. You're so nice, Jamie. God, I mean, love that. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right, we've got to take a break. We're going to fill up the room again with some other smart, beautiful women, because that's just what we do here. And uh, uh, don't go away. Green Rush Live continues after this. So for years, we've been doing manufacturing, financial services, uh, medical, and so forth on businesses that stand alone from doctor's offices to day traders to, uh, to even small banks. And so when cannabis came along, all of the tools, skills, and miscellaneous that we learned in there, we were able to apply it for them. And for us, it wasn't that big of a, of a problem or a challenge. It, it worked great. And so... Um, they just needed a reporting feature in one software, and uh, luckily that the software company came through for us, came it, came it back, and now it's become the, the backbone for our offerings, and uh, it uh, it's worked out incredibly well. And Okay, I'm back. Go ahead. I got you. Welcome back to the final half hour of Green Rush Live, our regularly scheduled, really live business of cannabis show that we do every Friday and have been doing it now for three years in this time slot. And I get a lot of I get a lot of pressure from people, mostly men, by the way, who say to me, "Why do you do it on Friday afternoon at four o'clock?" I said, "Because I want you to show up." All right. And, and it also has something to do with the fact that Friday 420, you know, I'm hoping my audience is out there enjoying and relaxing and chilling out and enjoying what they do. That's what we do. I am Jimmy Young, the founder of Pro Cannabis Media and the sometimes host of Green Rush Live. Um, we also have our new show that follows this really live talk show at the top of the hour. So you'll get to watch me anchor and see if I've lost my touch uh, reading off a teleprompter. It, it is what it is. I promise you, Elena Pinto will be back next week because I will say this, my numbers are half what Elena's numbers have been. So again, another reason why women have an opportunity in television on a regular basis. And I try to give as many opportunities to people who want to learn this crazy business as possible. All right, so let's get to our panel. Uh, again, um, Brooke Westlake is with us. Uh, guest hosting with me, and I so appreciate that. Um, her, she works with the Women in Cannabis Expo, and uh, she's really someone who is very comfortable um, being on camera and talking and asking great questions. And that's what I mean, Brooke. Those are the things I look for when I look for talent to train. So um, you, you, you got it, girl. Uh, we have with us Dale Sky Jones from Oaksterdam University. And, and Dale, uh, I'm very familiar with Oaksterdam University because I know we've talked with people over the last two or three years. We've had all these people I've talked to from there. And 
great reputation. People respect what, what you all do and um, just keep that up. I also want to bring back in Patty Pappas. Now, yes, I said bring back in only because I met her at an MJ Biz. I'm going, it was MJ Unpacked, if I remember correctly. Yeah, Patty, right? correct. MJ Unpacked, yes. The first one, George's first one in Las Vegas. That's where we met. I remember that interview. And uh, the third member of our panel this half hour is Meryl Gilbert. And uh, Meryl, I'm going to start with you because I want to make sure that your microphone's working properly. <laughs> okay, I'll be perfectly honest. Unmute yourself and tell us about what Trace Trust is and what role you play as CEO. Thank you. Um, so great to be here and always great uh, to share the the stage with um, these wonderful women. So I, I'm thrilled to be doing this. Um, Trace Trust was founded in 2015 and we come from a really long um, background in the food and beverage industry. And we work really um, closely on emerging trends in food tech. And we personal stories with cannabis as well, but we knew that this was an emerging industry. We knew that it was starting from the ground up and we were always strong advocates for how to have safe and reliable experiences and knowing that that was the biggest risk to the industry. And so when we founded this company, we set the first standards for food safety, um, for labeling. These are, are still um, very much a part of ASTM, which was leading the charge on that. And we um, have our first symposium coming up this fall that will really bring leadership from all disciplines for where we are in the industry now and next. And then on our, our work of not only guiding companies into the industry is we work with founders that are scaling businesses and getting ready to seek funding and getting them all set for that process and helping them to build their investor profile. Hmm. Well. We can talk about that at some point, but thank you for joining us. Appreciate that. And I have great questions about the infused beverage community that's starting to really uh, take off. I noticed that at NECAN. I, I think I had five interviews with people that are running beverage companies. It uh, is a game changer. <laughs> oh, 100%. And also the, the powder that you can actually put in any drink that's water soluble now that can be infused. But let's, let, I don't, let, let's, continue uh, with uh, Oaksterdam University's Dale Sky Jones. Um, how old is Oaksterdam University? What's the history and how is enrollment going? Hi, Jimmy. Uh, Hi. Well, the school was first formalized in 2007, although our founders started teaching, including to law enforcement and the city of Oakland back in the 90s. Uh, so we're a quarter of a century old now. Uh, we can rent a car. Uh, and um, with that, uh, you know, we've, we've really evolved. We've changed so much over the years uh, since that federal raid of 2012. Um, I came in uh, quite accidentally. I, I knew I was involved in the teaching side of it, but the spokeswoman side of it was what I didn't know I needed to do. Uh, and the school since then has taught over 80,000 individuals from 110 countries. And because it is, you know, women's day, you know, it's a lot of women that have just simply credited seeing other women that are just like them doing this and realizing it's okay. And so what we're doing now and who we're teaching, we still certainly teach the business of cannabis to various entrepreneurs who are in their own industries trying to figure out how to interface with this industry. Maybe they're in marketing or, or standards uh, and, and trying to understand what this is. Uh, but we also are now spending an awful lot of time working with governments. And we used to just teach one-off classes and courses, or generally we'd have somebody from some layer of government in every course or class we taught. But now we are working directly with, for instance, the, the city of Los Angeles, uh, city of Palm Springs, Oakland, uh, County of Monterey, and we've also recently launched with the State of Connecticut Social Equity Council a nine-month accelerator program. And we're teaching not just the workforce development, folks that are trying to go find a job with dignity that is uh, you know, really exciting in this industry if you can find the right employer and the right space and place, but it's also for uh, figuring out how to be an entrepreneur, how to write your business plan, professional development, business development, 
And in the case of these accelerators, we're also doing one-to-one -one coaching as well as putting you in front of investors. So it is the, the, the full soup to nuts experience uh, for folks that have been historically disadvantaged uh, and even you know, imprisoned uh, due to the war on drugs. So it is, uh, it's, it's really exciting and meaningful work and, and we're interacting with a lot of different sectors from government to education to of course the general public and the nonprofit work we do. We would love for you to educate the United States Senate if it's at some point, okay, please. That Working my, on it, uh, call your saying, senator and ask them to attend Oaks. I just, I, I, you know, guys, you know I'm from Massachusetts. So, you know, let, let's just leave it at that. Um, Patty Pappas from uh, Hello Again is here. And Patty and I met a few years ago at another trade show and we did an interview. So hello again, Patty. And tell us how is Hello Again going? Hello and, Again and is and going Tell the audience what well. it is, go ahead. So hello, hello again is a line of cannabis-based vaginal suppositories that my friend and co-founder Carrie Mapes and I um, founded just over three years ago. We were look, we looked into the cannabis space when it became legal in California, and we couldn't find a product that we felt comfortable using for our own wellness on a daily basis and a nightly basis. We didn't want to have a head high. We wanted to be consistent from usage to usage and user to user. And um, we experimented and we looked around and we decided that um, if we were on it, we were going to have to make it ourselves. So in 2020, we launched with Hello Again Every Day and Hello Again Sleep, which are vaginal suppositories. They allow us to deliver THC, quite a bit of THC. Our, our sleep formulation has 20 milligrams of THC in it without the head high. So you can, you know, get on the everyday and the sleep formulation. You can have meetings, you can have conversations, you can wake up and drive if you need to. And that was really important to us. So um, since the launch of those two products, we have now come out with Hello Again Period and Hello Again Hangover because we got so much response from our first two products that younger women were using it for their monthly pain, which makes sense. And um, hangover, you know, you have that extra glass of wine or two, and people were feeling a lot better than they felt like they deserved to. So um, we now are happy to be helping women relieve their symptoms from the age 21 and up. I got to tell you, you know, you guys have it rough. You know, you, you can do things that we can't do, reproduce, okay? Okay. And you have to go through the, the period thing. You have to go through menopause. You have to go through dealing with guys, which trust me, I get, okay? Because it's a challenge. It is a challenge. Uh, no, no doubt about it. Brooke, um, go ahead. I'm going to let you kind of take over the, uh, the, the discussion here and, and, and take us home if you don't mind. Okay. So I have an individual question for each lady because you guys are each in very different realms of this industry, which I find to be amazing. I'm going to start with Dale. Uh, I have a question is, do you feel or have other universities and colleges, are they coming to you guys and saying, we want to do a cannabis certificate program or a bachelor's program? Are they actively coming to you and saying like, how do we do it? Or are they just kind of doing their own thing? And if they are doing their own thing, would you advise them? I would think it would be in their best interest to come to you. You guys are the example. And so how is that, how is that shaking out and how's it working? An interesting question, Brooke. Uh, you know, it's, it is a bit of a challenge because, you know, we do have to find ways to earn enough money to pay the team, not only a livable wage, but good benefits. Uh, which is something that we've, you know, really achieved uh, finally after years of working towards that. Um, I also view these other educational institutions as our legacy. We needed this to be taught in medical school, in legal school, you know, that lawyers, doctors, CPAs, this should be everywhere from political science to, you know, biological science research. So it's very necessary that this is folded in that doctors, sorry, there's a bit of feedback, uh, that doctors had, um, that they're learning about the endocannabinoid system at the same time that they're understanding the circulatory system, that this, this is all part of uh, what we need to understand in, in all of these different disciplines. That said, there's still a very clear barrier for any university or college that accepts federal funds or who accepts students with federal funds in teaching 
this subject matter that breaks the Schedule I uh, laws, that any laws around teaching about the Schedule I drug, it's actually very specifically why we are not allowed to be a nonprofit. I operate as a not-for-profit, but I have to pay taxes. I'm not allowed to be nonprofit. So it's that same barrier. And it is a risk for any school or university to cross that line. So they can speak in generalities, but when you actually dive into the programs they're teaching, they're not allowed to touch that, that third rail, that red line cannot be crossed. And so for those reasons, we have developed many different relationships over the years, and one in particular with Golden Gate University, where they're just recognizing our programs for credit because they know they can't teach what we teach. Uh, we're just starting to get into those relationships. What's really been happening for the last 15 years is we've had uh, everyone from, from university and college professors all the way up through administrators coming and taking our courses and classes. Most of them shake my hand after, tell me who they are and say, wow, that was so awesome. I can't wait to write your program in my class. And it's like, wait a minute, <laughs> hold on here. Um, so there's, there's no question at, at how many programs, both pub public, private um, alike have, have looked to Oaksterdam as you know, as, as their inspiration of, of what they're teaching. Um, but, you know, we've worked really hard to stay at the cutting edge of this education and have a very strong feedback program, both with workforce and, and professional leaders who have to hire workforce. Um, you know, they were all our graduates from back in the day who grew up and started large, you know, the grew their corporations and are now dealing with workforce. Um, it, it's, it's important to, to realize that, that we're not just trusted, that it, it's really important to understand what those learning outcomes need to be that are practical for the student. It's not just in name only, that it's something that's going to improve their life. That social equity is ultimately about health equity as much as wealth equity. And so making sure that what we say we're, we're doing and what those students and graduates are walking away with, whether it's a single one-off program or a full certification, is, is that they're able to take that into the world and do something meaningful with it. We don't just teach people what they want to know. We teach them what they didn't know they needed to know, the what not to do's. Oh. And that is what a lot of the other institutions are failing at. They're not setting, they're, they're trying to set people up for success, which is fine but they're not preparing them for the worst and, and teaching them how to navigate in a very difficult, tricky, sticky industry where the law is not settled yet, banking is not safe, the IRS still comes after you. It's just, there's so many risks and people are like, oh, let me just teach you how to make money. And it's like, just, just buyer beware on, on those types of courses. Anyone will sell you what you wanna know, but are they teaching you what you need to know? That's great. And, and for that reason, we still invite it. Yeah. Adapted. That. That's Go strong. ahead. Go ahead. Oh yeah, no, that's amazing. Um, my next question is for Patty, and I, you know, I got to meet your co-founder Carrie last year in Las Vegas. I think it's amazing what you guys have developed as a product, especially for women. As Jimmy said, we go through all these transitions. How do you guys get your product in how, into the dispensaries, and how many dispensaries? or cannabis shops, I guess you could say, are you guys currently in right now? Because your product is definitely one that's needed. Yeah, we are currently in, I think we're almost 100 dispensaries throughout the state of California, which we're super proud of. Uh, we also can now deliver through our website. That was a big, um, big, big thing because a lot of the customers we felt when we started were like us and they didn't necessarily always feel comfortable going into the dispensary. So to be able to order from your home and have it delivered to you um, was important to us. So it was a struggle getting on those shelves, especially in the beginning, because one, we were talking about menopause to 25 year old buyers, male buyers. So we had to explain to them, you That's know, oh, this is menopause. These are the symptoms. You can't sleep through the night. You're tired. You're sweating. You have night sweats. And usually we'd have sort of this kind of dazed expression on their face. And oftentimes days later, they would call back and they'd say, you know, I talked to my mom or I talked to my sister and it's actually a really good idea what you guys are doing. We're like, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> we think so. But um, it was slow going we knew it was going to be slow organic 
growth with people trying the product and knowing that it made them feel better. It's getting a lot easier now because the wellness space shelves and dispensaries are getting bigger and bigger. You know, before they would be literally like this big, six inches, so they wouldn't carry a lot of different brands, but that's been changing. So we're feeling more and more optimistic about getting into more and more stores and um, being able to bring wellness and cannabis as a source of wellness to more and more women in California. That's great. Man, do men love you? That's all I can say, Patty. Okay. <laughs> right. I mean, it, it, and, and as a male with, I'm 60 freaking five years old. I got my own issues. All right. That being, that being said, you have to empathize with your partner who's going through all this. And I, Always say there must be something to help. There must be something to help. There must be something. Thankfully, you've you've delivered something that will make everybody happy on that part. Um, go ahead, Brooke. I, I jumped in because I can't. Yeah. No, you're good. Meryl, my last question goes to you. And I love that you're on the packaging, the 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 packaging labeling side. Um, my mom and stepdad were both in food and beverage for my stepdad was in for like 50 years. And then my mom was in for 20 years. What made you go into packaging specifically? Did you have a background in that before? Or was this something it just, it was like a calling to you and you were like, this is what I'm going to do in the cannabis space. So it's really that we're not in packaging overall, right? It is really about all safe and regulated products. And so that's where this really came from. It's, it's our experience in food safety, in HACCP training, in GMT certifications, in scaling. You know, my my business partner comes from the ag side and we both come from food manufacturing. We come from the hospitality. It's like, if you want to grow something, put it in a box, put it on a shelf, put it in a plate, anywhere along that, we know how to do that. And so really what started, um, initially we were just going to make beautiful plant-based edibles right we knew that we could scale that state to state we knew how you know to formulate we knew how to you know until we have nationwide legal access we knew how to mirror um but if you think back 2015 2016 we did not even have the nanotechnologies that that jimmy was talking about earlier um that we have today right and so those first clear concentrates those first clear extracts that were being used you know, it was a thousand to one. Like if you didn't have the knowledge and understanding on how that actually interacts, that if you didn't understand that it's very different um, in your system, a, a baked good, as we all know, because everybody has the brownie story, right? That they always refer to. Well, because that's a four to six hours sometimes, as opposed to a tincture under the tongue, you know, 15, 20 minutes, we have sublinguals now, we have the suppositories, we have so much, right? And so we knew that that was a very big thing. And that's why we wrote those initial standards on product safety that takes into the full life cycle of a product. Right now, all regulatory testing still focuses on the initial plant materials and potencies of THC and CBD and not all the other cannabinoids. It still doesn't look at that. And our biggest struggle, what has suffered so much, particularly here in California, is that we value THC levels of potency above quality, above the overall, where is that coming from? We don't treat it in, and we will get there. We're, we're headed in that, you know, as soon as we can do that. But, you know, we need to build out the Appalachian quality in the same way that we have in the wine industry, right? You can't call something champagne unless those grapes are actually grown in Champagne, France. <laughs> right? Napa Valley wine. If you put Napa Valley wine, it has to be grown in the county of Napa Valley. It can't be from someplace else. So our, our legacy growers, our farmers, our genetics, you know, we are, we're just going through this. So, so again, our, our big leadership push, our, our reasons that we exist and, and fight so hard of bringing all other industries into this is we have to be treated like all other industries to, to Dale, who has been, you know, so carrying the torch for all of us to be able to do this. But, you know, where we take on is we have to be treated by insurance companies. We have to be treated by banking. We have to be treated like other manufacturing. It's not this, you know, one off. It is an ingredient and it has the same, you know, capabilities and liabilities as anything else. So that is what our stand is. And so those standards are what we push for is so that when you look at a label, you understand what you're getting. You can read the label for one thing and you know how to use and administrate that and that you can back up all the way through where that came from. 
right? So a C, you know, we, we did this whole series on YouTube about um, good label, bad label. And, you know, one of them is QR codes to nowhere. What the hell is that about? Like, or this, like, this, do not touch this, right? This is not, we don't know where this came from. And so why do you see all this, you know, pushback on some of these other products? It's all in states that don't have any form of legal access. And they are literally, yes, it might be the original plant materials, but they are taking it and adulterating it in unsafe methods. And that's going to hurt us because to all of us, we want people to have this wonderful access to beverages. Beverages are equalizer, right? It's something that we can do. It's something that I can, and they can provide that experience of destigmatization, but they can also, we are trying to fit the needs of what you want. There is truly people that just want to get high, old school. That's what they care about. But the rest of us might just want something to relax. I want something that, you know, if my young children are in the room, I'm not, you know, passed out on the couch, right? We want to have these need states that is the future, experiential. Where is that experience? But I need to make sure that it's safe, reliable, and repeatable. You know, you know what's interesting is this week, I'm sure you know this, okay? Uh, it does look like the FDA may be stepping in and talking to the DEA about getting all those CBD products um, tested before they show up on the counter. And um, I think everybody recognizes that testing is good, Okay, knowing what you're you're getting is always good, and there has been um, some, let's say, um, uh, less than consistent results when yeah, the people have done independent tests on the various CBD products that are out there. Uh, I go back to what I said, Dale, about the U.S. Senate because I uh, educating the legislators are is so necessary because they are making decisions that are impacting everybody's life, either at the uh, federal level, the state level, or even the town level. Uh, and we all know how important education has to be in order to reach that normalization that I keep preaching about, because uh, legalization is a political issue, and there's going to be money involved, and big pharma is going to be involved. We need to get acceptance for this plant as a medicine, and then learn more about what the benefits really are and how it works. Just imagine if we hadn't banned cannabis in 1937 or taxed the you know what out of it, okay? How far ahead? Would we have as much cancer as we have now? No, we wouldn't. Would we have as much autism as we have now? Uh, no, we wouldn't. So we're really just starting over again in, in 2023. And it's gonna take people like the women in this room, the women that are in this industry that are going to understand this, we're in it for the long haul. It, it, now that it's been legalized in 21 states and there's a race to become 22, uh, it's here to stay. So um, first of all, I, we are up against the, the clock and I, I always like to hit my, my, my deadlines at the, at the right moment. So I do want to thank Brooke for being a great guest host. And as I said, Brooke, you know, I heard talk about a women-only talk show over the last two hours. I certainly would, would be loving to distribute something like that on a monthly basis or however many times you want to do something like this because conversation and education is how we're going to make the most change. And um, Lord knows I like to think of myself as a teacher uh, and a coach more than a um, whatever I am, businessman, sportscaster, ex-sportscaster, whatever. I, I really love sharing the experiences I've had in my life with others uh, to mentor them or, or impact their lives. That, that's what I'm all about. So uh, now that I've filled right up until the top of the hour, I want to thank Brooke. I want to thank Dale, and I definitely want to thank, hello again, Patty and Merrill. Uh, and Merrill, I, I want to talk to you eventually. We're going to do a beverage show, and I'm going to bring you back on so we can talk about that because I had, like I said, five interviews with new companies getting into the beverage space at NECAN um, just two weeks ago. So it, it, there's a future here. Um, that's going to wrap it up for another edition of a Green Rush Live, the really live business of cannabis talk show that we run here every Friday afternoon at 4 p.m. Eastern on the Pro Cannabis Media Network, our Roku channel, our Apple channel, our own homepage of our website, and of course, on all the other social media outlets. <laughs>
dinner out there. And as the dog said in the background, it is definitely <laughs> time to start my weekend and move on. So thank you all. Remember, it's a whole new world of weed out there, people. Use it responsibly. Thanks for watching. Thanks for listening. Thank you. So for years, we've been doing manufacturing, financial services, uh, medical, and so forth on businesses that stand alone from doctor's offices to day traders to, um, to even small banks. And so when cannabis came along, all of the tools, skills, and miscellaneous that we learned in there, we were able to apply it for them. And for us, it wasn't that big of a, of a problem or a challenge. It, it worked great. And so... Um, they just needed a reporting feature in one software, and uh, luckily that the software company came through for us, came it, came it back, and now it's become the, the backbone for our offerings, and uh, it uh, it's worked out incredibly well. Coming up on We Talk News this week, more rumblings out of the U.S. Senate about safe banking for cannabis. The chair of the banking committee says we need to pass safe banking this year. In the meantime, in Santa Cruz, California, thieves stole over a half million dollars worth of the green gold. And don't put all those marketing dollars into Twitter just yet. That site continues to shut down some cannabis related messages. And if 420 is a big holiday for you, you might want to come to Massachusetts to work for Temesco Wellness because you're going to get the day off. We'll have that story and more on our news from coast to coast on We Talk News next. So for years, we've been doing manufacturing, financial services, uh, medical and so forth on businesses that stand alone from doctor's offices to day traders to um, to even small banks. And so when cannabis came along, all of the tools, skills, and miscellaneous that we learned in there, we were able to apply it for them. And for us, it wasn't that big of a, of a problem or a challenge. It, it worked great. And so um, they just needed a reporting feature in one software. And uh, luckily that the software company came through for us, came it, came it back, and now it's become the, the backbone for our offerings. And uh, it uh, it's worked out incredibly well. And Cannabis Media. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's edition of We Talk News. I'm Jimmy Young, the founder of Pro Cannabis Media, filling in for the vacationing Elena Pinto, who will be back next week. Our top story this week is a toss-up. Do we talk about a huge robbery of a cannabis grow house in California or the hope about banking reform at the federal level? <laughs> Shocking or hopeful? I always go with the hopeful thing. So we start in Washington, D.C., where the Senate Banking Committee chair says we need to pass safe banking this year. Now, if you're keeping score at home, yes, safe banking has passed the House seven times in the last few years, but it's the Senate where that effort ends. Now, there just might be some hope. Safe banking is all about public safety. And since that industry is forced to be a cash retail market because of its federal classification as a Schedule One drug, but while cash is still king in the legal business, the asset is still the plant. In Santa Cruz, California, there were Two robberies of grow facilities in that town near San Francisco within two days. Now, if you ever have visited a grow facility, you know there are fences, video surveillance, and usually around-the-clock security force on the site. It still didn't stop heavily masked men with weapons from invading the facility in the wee hours of the morning last week. It took just 15 minutes for those organized invasions to get away with over a half million dollars worth of product, flour. All that weed is probably headed to the 
legacy market, which continues to be thriving in the early years of legalization. Some states are starting to go after the criminals who are targeting legal stores for cash robberies. And that's certainly true in Michigan, where their attorney general issued 12 warrants for the 20 robberies in that legal state. Here's the state's executive director for Normal, Rick Thompson, with more. Hello again. This is the Michigan Report with Rick Thompson on Weed Talk News. Let's begin. Michigan's attorney general has issued warrants for the arrests of a dozen people believed to be responsible for 20 or more break-ins at cannabis retail locations in May of 2022. She's charging the dozen with some combination of safe breaking, which is a life felony, criminal enterprise, a 20-year felony, and breaking and entering into a building with intent, which is a 10-year felony. The AG took this opportunity to push the United States Congress to enact cannabis law reforms like the Safe Banking Act. She said, quote, without access to traditional banking, the cannabis industry is left as a ripe target for criminals. And illegal businesses should have fair access to our banking institutions for the security of their own business and employees, as well as public safety. Michigan has experienced an unprecedented wave of robberies in cannabis retail shops during the last 12 months, and Congress has failed to pass banking reform for the cannabis industry for years. Well, last week I told you that cannabis retail prices in Michigan were rising and the number of cannabis plants being grown in the regulated market was lower. A recent article from Crane's Detroit Business Magazine examined the possible reasons for this. Enforcement action has scared some of the players who illegally supplement their inventory with unregulated cannabis. And the low cost of distillate oil means it's cheaper to buy it than to produce it in Michigan, resulting in fewer plants being grown. And the big guys are only growing what they need, which benefits the little guy, according to the experts cited in the article. The plant count today in the regulated market down more than 20% since September, per the article. And in a tough market, fewer plants directly translates into lower cost of operations. Well, you can add another name to the list of Michigan cannabis companies which have been placed in court-ordered receivership. Comco Wellness of Concord was revealed to be in receivership via a Facebook post by mid-Michigan cannabis attorney's principal, James McGilley. The letter he posted was dated March 14 and indicates those to whom Comco owes money should get in line to recoup their losses. According to a 2022 press release from Comco itself, the vertically integrated company was named one of Michigan's top dispensaries by Leafly. That designation was based on review data, reorder rates, and other factors. Per their website, Comco Wellness is a fully integrated wellness company which grows, produces, packages, and fulfills cannabis and CBD products through in-house brands and private white label opportunities. Comco is represented in this action by legal firm Miller Johnson. And that's it for the Michigan Report with Rick Thompson on Weed Talk News. The state of New York is trying to start the same initiative after over 1,100 illegal cannabis storefronts have opened in New York City, while the legal market just starts up. Pam Schmiel has our latest cannabis news from New York. I'm Pam Schmiel, host of the Mary Jane Society podcast with the New York City Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. Former New York City Mayor Mike Bloomberg speaks out on weed. He rarely weighs in on New York issues since leaving City Hall, but he is publicly blasting New York lawmakers. He claims the state took so long to get licensing operations up and running that it gave the illicit market a two-year head start on everyone else. He said that voters should demand that New York's governor and lawmakers take responsibility and fix this mess. And he's essentially saying that elected officials are allowing illegal stores to sell marijuana to kids and voters shouldn't forget it. And in other news, New York bans billboard advertising for cannabis companies. Advocates think it's unfair to prohibit weed companies from using the same marketing tactics that other regulated industry use, such as alcohol. 
And no surprise, a deadly blaze in a Bronx apartment fire is likely caused by cannabis grow lamps. Investigators have determined that the blaze was caused by electric heating lamp used to grow six marijuana plants. And the fire chief is reprimanding the Office of Cannabis Management, saying, we have seen before how dangerous these high-powered devices can be, and without regulations or guidelines to protect the public, people are unnecessarily being placed at risk. Marijuana laws need to be fixed, and the community demands it. And lastly, New York Governor Kathy Hochul has thrown her support behind civil fines for up to $10,000 a day for unlicensed commercial cannabis activity in an attempt to crack down on the state's thriving illicit market. That's this week's New York City Cannabis Report. I'm Pam Schmiel from the Mary Jane Society podcast, reporting for Weed Talk News. Next up, the Massachusetts Cannabis Report, sponsored by Holyoke Cannabis. Well, another week in Massachusetts, and yes, another new cannabis dispensary has opened in the town of Grafton. Discerned is the name, and Alan Villatoro is the CEO. They are located right on Route 122, and the definition of the word discerned is to perceive with the eyes, detect, or distinguish. Standing out from other licensed dispensaries is a real challenge for the over 300 stores now open in the Bay State. But Allen's location and dedication should distinguish this store and make it a dispensary destination. I, I just wanted to, you know, I guess establish some presence in the market to demonstrate that I'm not going to be just another cannabis, another, you know, pot store. Um, we're a full service cannabis company brand, really. And professionalism and legitimacy are at the top of, of what I want to accomplish. And this is why, you know, I still, I don't dress up like this anymore unless, you know, I, I have to meet with certain people that aren't familiar in that sense. And I do always try to promote the brand, but professionalism and legitimacy is where I come from in banking and, and this industry, I feel like sometimes lacks it and it gets thrown under the, the stigma. And I just, I, I that's not going to help us move this forward, you know? And uh, so uh, my thought on it was, I drill it at the team and they're like, no, we, we, you know, they they get it now, you know? Um, so it's legitimacy and professionalism is what I'm looking for. One more note from the Bay State. Employees at the medical dispensary chain Temesco Wellness are going to get a day off on April 20th. That's right. One of the busiest days of the year. And this dispensary will be closed. That's so that there are employees in the stores, their growing and manufacturing facilities, and in the corporate office will all be able to enjoy the annual cannabis holiday by not working. Bay State Cannabis Report is supported by Holyoke Cannabis, Holyoke's finest cannabis recreational experience. Now let's take a look at what is going on internationally in cannabis. And before we head over to Europe and Canada, let's talk about what is going on in South America and specifically in Brazil. 10 days ago, the Superior Court of Justice in that country announced it would be ruling on the future of cannabis. Reuters reports that the court will rule on whether farmers can plant cannabis legally. A biotech company wants permission to grow cannabis and import seeds with higher levels of THC than is currently allowed. The legalization movement has kind of stalled in Brazil's legislature over the past few years, and this ruling could open the door to a whole new market. The European market is heating up, and that's where Lex Pelger lives and follows the cannabis legalization movement. Lex? I'm Lex Pelger from Whitewell Creation with this week's European Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. In the newest report from the UN's International Narcotics Control Board, they address their concerns about states legalizing cannabis while the federal government keeps it illegal. The UN body says that according to the 1961 Single Convention on Narcotic Drugs, governments must carry out the provisions of this treaty within their own territories. While this seems to be a pointed poke at the United States, the practical impact remains unclear. Other UN members like Canada and Uruguay have legalized cannabis for adult use and faced no consequences. The Narcotics Control Board did state that simple decriminalization of cannabis without allowing for sales can be considered consistent with the convention, but full adult use legalization would not. In Germany, two updates. 
On the legalization side, after very good feedback from the EU, the country's health minister, Karl Lauterbach, said that a revised legalization proposal will be brought to the legislator in the next few weeks after it incorporates some of the changes suggested by the European Commission. There is also a legalization bill in the Budenstag right now, but it will probably be rejected in favor of waiting for the final details of the government's plan to emerge. In its current form, the proposed legislation from the health minister would allow adults 18 and older to buy and possess 20 to 30 grams of cannabis at federally licensed stores and possibly pharmacies. People would be allowed to grow up to three plants for personal use, with rules on enclosing them to prevent youth access. And upon implementation of the law, all ongoing criminal proceedings related to offenses made legal under reform would be suspended. On the medical side, the country just passed a new set of regulations designed to decrease bureaucracy for medical cannabis patients and increase access. They opened up cannabis prescriptions, allowing them to be made by all medical doctors and not just specialists. Only the initial prescription is required and no reauthorization is necessary for subsequent changes to doses or ingestion methods. And most importantly, health insurance companies can only refuse to cover medical cannabis prescriptions in exceptional cases. It appears that Europe's largest economy is rumbling forward in its acceptance of cannabis. Finally, in Afghanistan, the Taliban announced a decree banning the cultivation of hemp. Violators will be punished under Sharia law and their plantations will be destroyed. But a recent UN report highlights Afghanistan as the second largest source of seized cannabis resin in the world after Morocco. That's the European Cannabis Report for this week. For more on the science side, see my newsletter on Substack, Cannabinoids and the People. I'm Lex Pelger from Whitewell Creations reporting for Weed Talk News. In Kansas, the protests and attention over the past few weeks did not move the needle for reform. In fact, while there was a debate on a bill about starting a medicinal program in committee, that has now stalled and the issue has been tabled, perhaps ending any hope for reform for the rest of the year. Interestingly enough, the governor in that state, Laura Kelly, has been asking her legislature to work on getting a medicinal program going and approved, but now it's probably wait till next year. No such issue in neighboring Missouri. That's where Brandon Jones has our report from the Show Me State. Hey everybody, it's Brandon Jones from Bigger Distribution with Missouri Cannabis Report for Weed Talk News. And as you can see, I'm here at Lucky Leaf today. There's a fun festival expo going on here in Kansas City to help support the uh, cannabis industry and getting a lot of different uh, people from the industry all the way from devices to uh, humidity packs. So come out to Kansas City at Sheridan at Crown Center if you can come out here and support the cannabis industry and come out and check out Lucky Leaf. Uh, but also, like we talked about, Missouri sales has gone crazy over here. The first month reached over 100 million in sales. We, as we noticed, a lot of people from out of state are also coming in to get take part of the recreational aspect, and they don't have to have you know, that in their state where seven of the uh, bordering states do not allow recreational marijuana in their state. So we're seeing a lot of uh, people crossing the border. Just be safe when you're traveling back, I ask, or probably maybe, maybe people are actually consuming here in Missouri. Uh, very excited to see all the events that are getting ready to happen and just see how this Missouri market has taken off with people like Lucky Leaf uh, having a lot more expos and CannaFest and the 420 event all coming here to Missouri. So again, I'm Brandon Jones with Missouri Cannabis Report. We talk news. Everybody have a great week. In Mississippi, the medical program there is once again getting tweaked. The program has been operational for about a year now. The Board of Medical Licensure added some additional requirements that was not in the bill. Now, this would eliminate those. So that's certainly good news. No such issue, however, in Oregon, where there continues to be a glut of product. Marianne Kersergy has more from that state and when Jim Belushi's next season of his show comes out. I'm Marianne from Alibi with this week's Oregon Cannabis Report for We Talk News. A couple of weeks ago, we reported on the deaths of two Oregon cannabis entrepreneurs in Texas. This week, law enforcement officials have announced two suspects have been charged with murder. Officials are describing these murders as a weed deal gone wrong. Also, the state released the Oregon Economic and Revenue Forecast, which included some interesting points. One item is that cannabis tax delinquencies are increasing. Also, retail price per gram continues to decline and is at $4 a gram. And finally, Oregon's celebrity cannabis farmer, Jim Belushi's show, Growing Belushi, will be airing season three starting on 420. You will be able to binge that. That'll do it for the Oregon Report this week. I'm Marianne with Alibi for Weed Talk News. 
The race to be the 22nd adult use legal state to allow cannabis is still going on. One state that has made quite a bit of progress in the state's legislature is Pennsylvania. Not only that, but now the state is making it easier to obtain a medical card. Here's Scarlett Express's Maya Kristofowicz with more from the Keystone State. I'm Maya Kristofowicz from Scarlet Express, and I'm here in the Keystone State, Pennsylvania, reporting for Weed Talk News. Pennsylvania lawmakers will soon consider a proposal to create temporary electronic cannabis cards. State Representative Guzman says any delays in issuing a new card to patients may cause a lapse in their treatment and setbacks to their access to medical cannabis. The bill would require the Department of Health to develop and implement temporary electronic medical cannabis identification cards for renewals. The cards would be made immediately available in the patient portal after the department approves certification and receives the renewal fee. Next up, a Pennsylvania appeals court ruled Friday that the state's medical marijuana law does not prohibit insurers from reimbursing injured workers for medical marijuana in cases where the drug is used to treat accepted work injuries. The PA Commonwealth Court agreed that workers' comp carriers are required to reimburse injured workers who use medical marijuana to treat severe and often lifelong injuries. This is a game changer for those in injured workers who have worked hard to get off dangerous and expensive opioids and are forced to pay the cost of medical marijuana treatment out of their fixed incomes. Firestone Tire and Rubber argued it would violate federal law if forced to reimburse for medical marijuana, which is illegal federally, but the court ruled reimbursement is not a federal crime because insurers are not prescribing the drugs themselves. Well, that's a wrap from Pennsylvania. I'm Maya Kristofowicz from Scarlet Express, and I'll be back next week to talk about what's hot and what's not in Pennsylvania. From We Talk News, have a fabulous week. When it comes to the stock market, our expert is Doug Miller from High on Wall Street. Here's this week's Cannabis Stock Report with Doug. Hello, everyone. I'm Doug Miller from High on Wall Street with this week's Cannabis Stock Report for Weed Talk News. Cureleaf, they did it again. Well, they are closing an entire cultivation site in New Jersey, and it's a large operation. And if you listen to the Green Rush Live often, you will hear me mention this particular facility. I know the facility very well, and I've said they've been caught selling moldy product multiple times, and their product just is not good coming out of there. I'm sorry, it's not. If it was good, I would say it was, but it's not worth buying. So I understand why they're closing. And I can see them closing the doors in that New Jersey location and other ones as well pretty soon. But let's go ahead and look at the stock chart because it closed at 305 today. It's going in the basement and it's just dipping deeper. It's an OTC stock at this point. You're talking about a company that was pumped so much money. I mean, so much investor money and they just burned through the cash like it was nothing. The companies run terribly. They don't know what they're doing in the cannabis industry. And uh, it shows because they're going to be out of business real soon. So Cureleaf, you should get your stuff together. You had to close down in the top three markets, Colorado, Oregon, and California. I mean, come on. Now you're closing this huge facility and you're going to be closing your doors at many others. So it's dipping down. I'm not touching it. That's this week's Cannabis Stock Report reporting for Weed Talk News. I'm Doug Miller. Remember a few weeks ago when Twitter made this big announcement that they would be allowing for cannabis companies to advertise? Well, it only took three hours for one company from Las Vegas to post an ad for their cannabis accessories before Twitter took them down. The company is Hemper, and their marketing director is not deterred. He will continue to try to get his messaging out about his paraphernalia. Now, you know the saying, politics makes strange bedfellows? Well, now a major alcohol industry association is calling for the federal legalization of cannabis. That's right. The Wine and Spirits Association points out the disparity between federal law and state laws, and that's the reason why they're on board. They also said that their industry has set a great example for cannabis serving as a role model. So for all of you who have cut out alcohol consumption and replaced your buzz with cannabis, let's show some equal time for wine and spirits. That's this week's We Talk News. I'm the founder of Pro Cannabis Media, Jimmy Young. Elena Pinto will be back 
next week. But remember, it's a whole new world of weed out there. Use it responsibly. It's a whole new world of weed out there, isn't it? Everyone is learning new ways to titrate, ingest, consume, imbibe, and engage with this plant medicine we call cannabis. Hi, I'm Jimmy Young, the founder of Pro Cannabis Media and the host of In the Weeds. And once in a while, the really live business cannabis talk show we call Green Rush on Friday afternoons from 4 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern. Now, let me tell you my cannabis story. You know, I've had four major surgeries in the past 23 years and suffer from osteoarthritis with a variety of metal parts in my body and one on deck. Now, thanks to those chronic pain issues, I've been a medical patient in Massachusetts for almost 10 years now. I remember my first trip to a dispensary just outside of Boston, and I told the bud tender I didn't want to smoke it anymore. So I tried edibles, then tinctures, then vaping. And now if I'm going to smoke, I only use the Weejits filtration system. What? The Weejits.com, Weejits, that's weed, W-E-E-D, G-E-T-S.com, is where you'll find the planet's coolest product that cools the smoke from everyone's favorite flower. The guy that started this was a pretty good medical device manufacturer, and he created this maze pipe that cools the smoking process from 1300 degrees Fahrenheit upon inflammation down to just 90 degrees when it reaches your mouth. That's right, 1300 down to 90. That's why this maze pipe is amazing. So here's how it works. You start with that glass bowl, you flame on, and then you inhale nice and smooth so the smoke goes through three different filtration and cooling systems. Now, if pre-rolls is your thing, you can use the Weejits filter that a pre-roll fits into perfectly. That's right, or even a chillum. The more filters, the smoother the draw. Best of all is the price. You can get all this or one or the other for just a few bucks. It'll cool your smoke and you'll give your lungs a break. Now, add in the code of PCMTV and you get 15% off. So just go to Weejits.com and check out the best way to enjoy a cooler smoke with less coughing and hacking and more peace of mind. All that resin and tar is collected in the polyurethane filters that are easy to clean with soap, water, and a few Q-tips. Your lungs will thank you and so will I. As a broker, we have access to many, many cannabis carriers. So I will go in with two or three uh, quotes for people. The quotes might be 20,000 for one, 22,000 for another, 17,500 for another. Pretty close among the three. What I tell people is it's not the pricing, it's what's included and not included, meaning exclusions. An exclusion in layman's terms is just something that's not included. It's not on the menu, so it's just not included. But if you don't know that, if no one shows you that on page 71 of a 150 page policy, you're not going to know. No one knows. I never met one person that says they read an insurance policy. If you do, you know, I got some property in Florida for you. Weed Talk and In the Weeds are two productions of pro-cannabis media supported by Revolutionary Clinics, one of the top medical cannabis dispensaries in the Massachusetts area. Now with three locations in Greater Boston, two in Cambridge and one on Broadway in Somerville. Rev Clinics has a patient first mission. They will customize your needs as a medical patient with the proper titration and combination of strains, flavors, and products. Rev Clinics, where the patient comes first. So the, the reality of the matter is, uh, you know, big banks and small banks are going to be different in a lot of ways. 
and they're both gonna have their advantages and disadvantages. For a business like cannabis, you really have to have an integral knowledge of that business and a real granular knowledge of that business and the players involved in it. And that's why if you look at the banks that are successful to play in this space in Massachusetts, they are smaller banks that are very heavy, intensified, personal touch, human communication, where you don't get a lot of that with the bigger banks.